I am here with Dan Byrne, our CRO, to talk about our most recent article and um, you know the things that are in the news right now, which all the talk is about inflation. And I think one of the important things when we're talking about inflation, as far as logistics goes, is costs and rates. Um, so, Dan, you know, what's the first thing that you're thinking of, and you know, what's on your mind in this current inflationary environment? Yeah, thanks a lot, Matt. Good question. Um, I think the first thing that's on my mind is while certainly we are in a very unique and unprecedented uh, period uh, of economic, you know, turmoil and supply chain turmoil, it's not the first time that we've been through, you know, a similar type of upheaval in the economy that's driven a lot of activity in procurement. I particularly remember 2007 and 2008, um, you know, in 12 months, the price of gas went from you know, a dollar seventy-five to two dollars and ninety cents to three dollars and fifty cents back to a dollar forty, uh, and there was a lot of uncertainty about demand and what the impacts were going to be uh, on the economy long term. And as a result, in the first quarter and second quarter of two thousand eight, a ton of uh, shippers put their work out to bid. I think the combination of that and the fact that you know it was one of the largest transportation final mile transportation companies in the in the country, we get most of our new business through a traditional procurement process, we've got a point of view, I think, on what, you know, what's the best way to run a process like that to get the best results. And the first uh, way, without a doubt, is to sort of understand um, what good, solid, transparent data is and what it means to the quality of the responses that uh, that, that you get back from a procurement or an RFP. It's, it's a big issue, you know, that couldn't be more important in this particular environment because demand has been so impacted um, in many different ways uh, that you know a commitment to transparency about historical data, seasonality that you've seen, how that's compared to prior year seasonality, and how confident you are or aren't in your um, 2022 uh, volume forecasts will be critical to be getting to be getting good information, particularly if you're going to want to go to contract for a two or a three year time frame, which is what most people do when they put transportation procurements out. Um, I think another part of that that's that's critically important, really, as it impacts um, visibility and accountability and even the billing process, is what are your requirements for transacting business digitally. Um, what's your process for tendering freight uh, to vendors? How much advance notice do they get? Um, how is that done? Is that done through API, a common EDI transaction set? Are you sending files over? Most ship, most carriers can support either one of those, but clarity around that and what the expectations are, not only for status updates, how it supports the uh, um, freight pay uh, process, as well as clear expectations around the implementation timeline. Um, we frequently see uh, customers um, that your shippers that we're talking with not really clearly communicate what kind of lead time their IT organization is going to need to bring a new carrier on board. So clarifying those expectations and data requirements up front are going to be really good and, and important to creating a, a solid RFP to go to market with. Um, I think the next thing that I, I kind of think about or, or sort of once bids are in and we you start getting into an evaluation strategy, um, you know, what are the ways to sort of consider, you know, you know, rates and, you know, total cost of, of service. So from a rate perspective, clearly um, a, a leverage point that shippers have that they can exercise to get better unit costs is to be prepared to, to exchange higher volumes and more volume for better rates. Whether that comes with introducing new carriers into the marketplace or looking to consolidate around existing vendors, that's going to be a, a, a fairly common and well, well thought out strategy. Um, I think clear thought processes around um, volume discount structures, how those are measured, how those are audited, when are payments or credits given, uh, and what what historical period are you looking at in order to have that tied up? It's going to save you a lot. A lot of work on the front end will save you a lot of uh, contesting on the back end in terms of how rates and discounts um, you know should be applied and whether those uh, apply to your base cost, independent of fuel and accessorials, or whether they apply to your total cost. And what we find in many cases is that the way co transportation costs are allocated inside the shippers organization 
does have a bit of an influence over how um, you know discount structures uh, can be put together. And then the other side of that, of course, is that you get what you pay for, and in many cases, you don't get what you don't pay for. So there, there is a you know tendency to kind of think about um, services from an operational perspective as being equivalent. Um, I've seen a lot of different approaches to this. Frankly, a zero approach where we don't really kind of consider the operational implications of changing service providers, that the that transportation can be viewed sort of as a commodity, all the way to parallel qualitative evaluations independent of cost, which are can be pretty rigorous. Um, there's probably a middle ground that makes the most sense given the time certainty to, to you know, get you know, procurements into the market and get decisions made. But a qualitative evaluation of technology robustness, the quality and rigor of the billing process, operational visibility, um, things like claims rates, missing package rates, um, controllable and uncontrollable on time delivery performance. These are the types of things that you can sort of get a little bit better um, read on what your uh, soft costs are going to be of you know transitioning the vendors and how from a total cost of service perspective how defensible a rate's going to be um you know just sort of the layman's take which is you know now is the time to look at quality not quantity or lack or you know less quantity of cost because it's going to be a little bit more difficult to control for cost because of the environment um that we're in but this is the time where you can just direct cost rate cost, but you can control for costs in other areas by doing a lot more due, due diligence than you might have done in the past. Is that sort of the layman's take on it? I think that's a good a good take on it. I would I would say that um I mean we you know we can't you know pretend that in an inflationary environment that costs aren't going to be a consideration and that are in that shippers and companies of all types are going to need to, to take a look at and figure out ways to mitigate costs. Um, but we just got to remember that, um, you know, we're all dealing with that. So that affects all of us, you know, equally um, and, and there's going to be compression there. So asking for too much creates operational risk. Not asking for enough, frankly, probably leaves opportunities on the table. And I don't think any shipper is going to want want to do that. Um, but I think there's ways to sort of probe and explore on, you know, the rigor associated with with different costs. Another way to kind of think about this is to try to understand the density in particular markets of the folks that you're, you know, that you're getting bids from. Um, the denser someone's network is in a particular market, the more opportunities they have to be more efficient, share freight, I would also consider along those lines kind of relaxing timeliness requirements particularly in order to get rate increases if you're particularly concerned about that. Um, and I think if we've taught if been taught anything in the last um, you know 18 months is that demand surges are are one thing, but the you know missed demand or being low on forecast, which has happened as a result of this bottleneck, is equally damaging. So I would you know I would advise shippers to be open to um, pricing variability that somehow reflects major dislocations in, in demand forecasting, either upward or downward, in order to protect the, you know, the viability of the relationship. And if that's not comfortable you know, on a long-term scenario, consider, consider reducing your, your RFP cycle and looking at 12-month contracts instead of 24-month, or two-year instead of three years. Uh, and that gives you some opportunities to to maybe mitigate those those uh, those issues. And and just to hone in on that point, are do you think that we're going to see shorter term contracts for the next few years, given this inflation cycle and just the fluctuation of all sorts of you know macroeconomic factors going on in the U.S. economy? I, I think it's going to be a, a, an answer that depends on what what the reference point is from the person from the company that's putting out the bid. Um, I could certainly see you know a case being made for shorter term contracts for the coming year for for 2022. I'm not sure that that's going to need to be carried forward. I think we can get back to a normal contract cycle for for services, you know, potentially after next year. However, if I'm in the position where, you know, all of the impacts that have been occurring around 
you know, the availability of drivers and, you know, the rate, you know, the, the labor rate increases for hourly labor. If I'm running a fleet and I'm considering outsourcing that fleet, I would definitely recommend a longer term agreement. Um, and I would also plan on sort of a, a relook at that agreement because frequently with insourced, you know, private fleets, the data quality associated with the work that's actually being done, the frequency, you know, the volumes and so forth is kind of missing. So there may be a case for running a sort of a running your procurement, picking an outsource partner and using the first six months to build a base case of how the network actually operates versus the information you're able to gather prior to your procurement and then setting rates, you know, at that point. But I could see outsourced agreements, which I think really will grow in popularity um, in response to what's been going on the last couple of years, definitely warrant longer term agreements.